uh, uh, cropping concepts for sponsoring this session on Canola 101. And uh, first up, we're going to have uh, uh, Jim Davis. Uh, Jim is, uh, as many of you know, probably is a native of northern Idaho. Uh, he got his master's degree in plant science at the University of Idaho. He's been working for the past 26 some odd years on uh, canola and other kinds of crops in Jack uh, Brown's program and, and probably is one of the more knowledgeable people, if not the most knowledgeable people on, and, and with experience in canola. So with that, uh, uh, Jim, take it away. Thank you. So today I want to uh, talk a little bit about some uh, basic uh, canola production things. <coughs> Uh, and I want to first mention that when you have questions about canola, there's a lot of online resources that you can look at even in the field with your phone. And I made a handout, which I handed out to some of you already, uh, but there's some of the back there as well that you, you can pick up. So I've got a whole page of places where you can get in information. Some of it is uh, out of Canada, uh, and so it's not all 100% applicable to us, but in general, it's pretty good information. Uh, the Canola, Canola Council in Canada has some really great flyers and stuff. Uh, this one is about uh, fungal diseases, uh, specifically about sclerotinia. It's got a good rating system. You can download these as a PDF for free and print, and print them out. Uh, they've also got one that's diseases, or uh, insects, I mean. Uh, so lots of great pictures of insects. Help you a little bit with insect ID. All right, so with that, let's, uh, let's move on. One of the first things that I always start with, and you've seen me talk before, you've seen this slide every time I've talked about growing canola, is just really important to know your uh, herbicide history in your field. A lot of the... Um, a lot of the herbicides that we use in our wheat rotation or with legumes have serious plant back restrictions when we're looking at canola or, or any of the other brassica crops like mustard. So it's really important to keep good herbicide records and go back and consult those records uh, when you're starting to think about whether or not you're going to plant canola. Uh, I thought I'd start by showing you what your typical healthy canola plant looks like. Uh, at various different growth stages. On your right is a seedling with a couple true leaves uh, and then uh, the one on the far left is maybe a month out of the ground uh, for, spring, for spring canola. But notice we've got pretty large leaves. Uh, the leaves have kind of rough edges. Uh, they've got big lobes. And if we look at the next slide. Uh, here's a uh, a canola seedling that has damage from uh, pursuit herbicide uh, in the soil. And one thing to notice, the leaves, are, uh, the veins are kind of purpling there, the growing point's dead, and, and the leaves are kind of spoon-shaped and kind of cupped, so they don't have that typical lobed look to them. On the upper left here, there's a uh, healthy canola plant. And then we've got uh, some sulfonylurea herbicide damage. And so you can see that even the cotyledons don't look quite right. They're kind of thick and fleshy on the, on the upper right. And the growing point is, is, is killed, dead. Uh, on the lower left, the difference there is the purpling. There are a lot of purpling on the bottom of the cotyledons. And then on the lower right, again, you can see a, uh, you can see a healthy plant there with a normal leaf starting to expand, whereas the, uh, the damaged plant has a growing point that's, that's not doing very well. Uh, this is an example on, on the right of some healthy plants and um, sulfonylurea herbicide residue on, on the right. And you, you can see that what happens is the healthy plants, the ones without the residue, continue to grow, and the ones with the herbicide residue just kind of set there and they don't grow. Sometimes you don't see as distinct symptoms. Those plants all look, look fairly healthy, but the ones on the right are never going to catch up with the ones on the left. And you may not know what the problem was, but you're going to have kind of a sick, punky crop. Um, you may lose 
15, 20, 25% of your yield, but never really have a good idea why, uh, unless you go back and look at these plant back restrictions. There's a few other things that look a bit like uh, herbicide damage. Anybody want to take a guess at what this is? You've got kind of a, a sad looking growing point there and the leaf looks a little rough, got some purpling, that's frost damage. And so you have to be a little bit of a detective if you see something like this in your field. You need to look at what the low temperatures were, how well it's distributed. Typically with frost damage, all the plants in a given area will, will look like this. Whereas a lot of times with the herbicide damage, it's just uh, random plants. There'll be some that look perfectly fine and then some that look damaged. This is another example of frost damage. And then this is sulfur deficiency. So I want to talk a little bit about choice of crops because when people say canola uh, or oil seeds, there's a number of crops to choose from depending on what climatic zone you're in and how it fits into your rotations. So you've got a number of options. Typically, if you've got irrigation, you're going to get the best bang for your buck out of winter canola. Uh, you can plant that after another crop. You've got enough water to get the crop well established. Um, Wheat fallow zone, you're for mo in most cases going to be limited to winter canola after fallow, so just like winter wheat. Um, if you're in the lower rainfall and, uh, and you're trying to do an annual cropping, uh, camelina or yellow mustard is probably going to be the best because they're most adaptable to the drier conditions. Uh, they're fairly short season. Uh, they can withstand some of the heat a little better. As you get more rainfall, of course, you have more options to choose from. Uh, so intermediate rainfall zone, you know, we're I'm talking like 15 to 18 inches. Um, typically, you can choose any of these crops, spring canola, the different mustard species, camelina, or winter canola, but you're still going to need to be on fallow most years to be able to establish that crop in the fall. And then in the high, high rainfall zone, uh, I usually take out the yellow mustard and the camelina just because it's not going to have as high a yield potential, not going to be able to use all the moisture as well. Again, um, we have uh, some choices once we start looking you know, more directly at, at canola. Are we going to be growing edible uh, oil seeds, so specifically canola, or maybe industrial rapeseed? Um, these are the same species, they just have different oil qualities. So it's you know, no different than, say, white wheat and red wheat. Um, industrial rapeseed, sometimes you'll get a little premium on the price, but because it's a small market, you do need to be sure of, of, <coughs> of your market and make sure you have a place to, sit, to sell that. Obviously, as you're making a choice between these different crops, you're going to look at the commodity price, the performance in your area, seed availability, cost, uh, and, and a, num a number of other things to see how well they fit on your farm. Now if you've narrowed it down to canola, there's actually three different species that can produce canola. So it's kind of like bread. We can have cornbread, we can have bread made out of wheat, we can have rye bread. Well, you can have canola from three different related species. A Brassica rapis, the same species as turnips. Typically, it's called Polish canola, or winter and spring types. These are very early. Uh, Brassica gensia is uh, a mustard species, but there have been canola quality varieties developed. Uh, these are available only as spring. Uh, they tend to be a little earlier, um, and, and they are shatter tolerant, and not resistant. Uh, and there are clear field, uh, uh, clear field varieties, so resistant to beyond herbicide. The most common species grown as canola, which you're probably most familiar with, is Brassica napus, which is the same species as rutabagas, commonly called Argentine canola, at both winter and spring types. It's going to have the highest yield potential given um, enough moisture and, and a good growing season, and there's lots of choices uh, with respect to varieties. Now we, we've got uh, variety trial data available so you can evaluate um, different cult cultivars in your region. Uh, we typically do about eight sites throughout the inland northwest each year. I've got a poster just outside the door 
uh, as well as some handouts, some flyers you, you can take. Uh, flyers look like this. Um, so I've got some here this year from 2013 and 2014. And we've also got them on our website, which is on that handout as well. Just a real brief word about fertility. You're going to be looking at about 8 pounds of nitrogen per 100 pounds of seed yield. That's total available, nit total available nit nitrogen throughout the root zone. So you're not going to be applying this much in, uh, in most cases. Uh, canola is a high sulfur use crop, and so you want to have a, about a 4 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur ratio. So if based on your soil test and yield expectations, you want to put down, say, maybe 100 pounds of nitrogen, you're going to be wanting about 20 to 25 pounds of sulfur. It's also important, especially in the plus, to test for boron levels. Our soils are kind of marginal in boron, and if you're below a half a part per million, you need to add about a pound of boron. Boron is very important. Uh, for the flower and, and seed formation. There's some fertilizer guides. Uh, we've got these two Northern Idaho fertilizer guides that go through all the different um, nu uh, uh, nutrients and how to interpret the soil test. Uh, and there's also some information on fertility on the WSU oilseed site. You always want to give your crop the best chance you can, and so you want to start with good quality seed. Uh, I always recommend that you use certified seed. Uh, that's going to reduce the chance of introducing uh, some diseases like black leg that we don't want. Uh, you want to look at the seed age and the germination on the seed tag, and use treated seed. These days it's getting hard to find canola that doesn't come treated. Uh, and, and in general, that's a good thing because it's going to help you reduce uh, losses to insects as well as diseases. Seeding rate, well, that depends. That depends on whether or not you're selling the seed or you're buying the seed. <laughs> Basically, you want to shoot for about 400 to 500,000 seeds per acre, but the seed size of canola varies a lot from variety to variety and from production year to production year. So you can have a 100% variation in seed size, and typically you can get this information off of your seed tag, or you can harass the guy who sold it to you. So you can actually go in and, and, and do some calculations to see how many pounds you actually need to get to that 400,000 seeds per acre. In general, with winter canola, that's going to be somewhere in the three to six pound per acre range. Spring canola, four to seven pounds. And I usually advise people you know, to work in the four to five pound range. If you're an experienced grower or you have a good seed bed and, and you expect to get good germination and establishment, you can go towards the lower end of these seeding rates. But if you're just starting growing canola uh, or you may have kind of a rough seed bed, a little higher seeding rate is going to help you get a good crop established. And when you look at that germination percentage, for every 5% non-germinating seed you have, you want to add about a quarter of a pound. So if you had, say, for example, a seed lot that had 90% germ, you're going to want to up your seeding rate by about a half a pound. Seeding dates. Typically with spring canola, about as soon as you can get into your field. But you do want to be waiting for the soils to be warming up. Typically in the northwest, you know, our soils warm up fairly fast most years. Um, and so if, if you've got a good forecast for uh, weather in the next week, week or so, even if your soils aren't quite warm enough, you can go ahead and stick the seed in the ground knowing that the soil is going, is going to warm up. With winter canola, we typically want to have it in the ground in general before August 30th to be able to get it up big enough to have good winter survival. Once you get your crop established, probably the next thing you're going to be concerned with is weed control. There's a limited selection for traditional weed control. Um, and so you want to start with good agronomic practices. Uh, Pre-plant uh, glyphosate to get weeds uh, handled, uh, get good plant establishment, so ha have a good firm seed bed if you're in a conventional tillage situation uh, with packer wheels on your drills. Try to use good planting dates and get a good competitive stand so it competes <coughs> well with the weeds. That we do have some herbicide options. Uh, in conventional till, we can use some pre plant incorporated things like uh, Treflan or Sonolin. For grassy weeds, there's several options. Uh, it's all group one, her group one herbicides, but we do have Select, Assure, Targa, Post. 
And then for post-emergence, uh, we've got uh, chlor chlorpyrrolid, which is available now as a number of different brand names. And that's going to give you control of things in the thistle family or the legume family. Um, it's especially good for spot spraying for things like can for Canada thistle. It's kind of expensive, so it's not something that you're probably going to want to spray over the entire field uh, as a general rule. But if you have areas that, say, got patches of dog fennel or pineapple weed, or if you've got uh, prickly lettuce, uh, chi uh, chi uh, china lettuce, uh, it'll give you good control of that if you hit them when the plants, when the weeds are still fairly small. A number of different herbicide resistant canolas. Uh, there's Clearfield canola. Uh, and because of the herbicide resistance mechanism it has, it provides some tolerance uh, to the imidazolinone and the sulfonylurea herbicides, so you have less concerns about those plant back restrictions. Uh, but it's a very common mode of action, uh, and so we don't want to overuse our group 2 herbicides if we can avoid that. So typically, I advise people to look at Clearfield canola when they have plant back issues. Uh, they use maybe, uh, they maybe they're in a P rotation where they've had pursuit or they've had Clearfield wheat with Beyond, and they want to get in, into, into canola. Clearfield is going to allow them to do that. Uh, but it would be a good idea for a herbicide rotation to come in with some of the traditional herbicides I just talked about to, uh, to do the weed control. Of course, we've got the genetically modified uh, GMO types, uh, Roundup Ready canola, as well as Liberty Link canola. Uh, Liberty Link being uh, resistant to glufosinate, uh, which is marketed under a number of names, but including Liberty. Both of these types have really good yielding cult, uh, cultivars, and so with all the herbicide resistant types, you're, you're going to be able to find well adapted cultivars that will give you good, good yields. I've been told that the Liberty herbicide is a little weak on some of our grasses, uh, and there's a recommendation to tank mix it with a grass herbicide, but talking to some growers, they've been really happy with the weed control that they got with Liberty. Quick word about insect pests. Uh, we're kind of fond of saying that every insect known to man likes to eat canola. And if you've grown canola, you might know what, what I mean. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about flea beetles. They're very small uh, little insects that they overwinter as adults and they're ready to and very hungry as soon as the spring canola comes out of the ground. And they can really decimate your crop and that's where the seed treatment comes in. There's a number of different seed treatments available now. Uh, most commonly, you'll see the Helix Extra or Prosper 400, but those are being, I think, phased out in, in favor of some new fungicide chemistries, uh, the Helix Vibrance and the Prosper Evergold. Um, even when you use the seed treatment, some years you may have to come in with a foliar application a little bit later. And I've seen this happen during wet, cool springs when the canola is growing slowly. And I think what's happening is when we get a lot of rainfall in the spring like this, it moves the seed treatment away from the roots of the seedling. And so the seedling isn't taking up the insecticide as well, and so you're not getting the same protection. And so if you've had a long, cool period of, of, of rainy weather in the spring, and then it warms up, those flea beetles are going to be very active. So that's a really important time to be scouting your crop. And if you get about 20% defoliation, which would be a little more than that picture I'm showing there, and especially as you look at the growing point, uh, you're going to want to come in and spray with, with a foliar uh, herbicide, and there's a number of options available. We're going to talk a little bit about pest control more tomorrow, uh, so we'll go into a little more detail on that. There are a number of uh, mid and late season pests that can be a problem. With uh, spring canola, some years diamondback moths are a problem. There are these small little worms here, and they're a problem during flowering because they will come in and they eat the flower buds, and so that really sets the crop back. And so again, you want to be out there looking at your field at the beginning of the flowering to make sure that, that you don't have a, have a diamondback moth infestation. So the, the little small worms like that, and they spin webs, and so if you 
tap the plant, they'll fall off the plant and hang from the webs, an easy way to identify them. Cabbage seed pod weevil is typically more of a problem in winter canola, uh, just because of the timing. They overwinter as adults as well, and then they come on about the time the winter canola is starting to flower and set pods, and they lay their eggs in the winter canola, and then the larvae eat the seed as the seed develops inside the pods. Uh, later in the summer, uh, the larvae crawl out and they pupate in the ground and the new adults come out mid midsummer. And so towards the end, mid to the end of July, you might see cabbage seed pod weevil in your spring canola, but these are the newly emerged adults and they're not going to lay eggs till next year. So when you see them in spring canola in July, you don't need to worry about them. Uh, but typically you need to spray for them in winter canola every year. And then the cabbage aphid can be a problem. Uh, typically more often in spring canola because it's greener longer, but it can be a problem in winter canola, especially in the fall uh, when you, after you've, uh, you've just planted it. Hit the right button here. So uh, just some rough guidelines with cabbage seed pod weevil and winter canola out there at the end of May, first part of June. You see you know, two to three weevils per plant or three to four per sweep of a, of a sweep net, uh, that's going to be enough that's going to pay you to spray. Diamondback moth larva, uh, you need to have quite a few more of those, 10 to 15 per square foot, um, or about 10 per plant. Cabbage aphid will come in and they'll it'll typically infest a single stem and you'll get a colony of aphids growing up there by the flowers. And you're going to be looking at somewhere in the range of a 20% infestation on the flower stalks. Uh, sometimes you need to go in and look closely at the flower stalks because you might have a small colony in amongst the flowers that you can't see from a few feet away. Uh, but basically one, one in five there. Uh, especially in winter canola in the fall, uh, sometimes grasshoppers are going to be a problem. And you want to, again, scout your fields pretty reg regularly so you know what's going on there because things can, can change quickly. A uh, number of foliar insecticides are available now, uh, better than it was, was a few years ago. Uh, and this is something you can work with your field man and your ag rep, decide what's going to work best on, on, on your farm uh, for you. But they're all pretty uh, effective on, on all these pests, other than the last one, Fulfill, is just specifically an, uh, an aphidicide. Real quick review of some canola diseases. Um, start with black leg. It's one of the most important diseases in, in the Canadian prairies and the Midwest. It's not typically found in the Northwest. And we have considered our area black leg free, and, and Washington still may be black leg free, but we've found black leg uh, in, in Idaho. Uh, and I should point out if you've grown potatoes, this is not the same organism as black leg in potatoes. This is a seed borne fungus. Uh, and once it's established, once you bring it in on seed or if it happens to be in the residue from a previous crop, it'll spread around the field by splashing water or airborne spores. And it can survive in the crop residue and, and volunteers for a number of years. So here's some pictures. We've got these small lesion on the cotyledon, which would be caused by a seed infection. Here's a lesion on the leaf. Here's a stem lesion, and you get these dark colored stem lesions, which is why they call it black leg. Here's a close up of a stem lesion. Typically, what these lesions do is they girdle the stem, kills the plant, and the plant falls over. So you have these dead plants like this in a bad infestation uh, that have lodged or fallen over. So, prevention again, start with good seed. You don't want to bring the, the disease in if we don't have it. Uh, there are now some rules in place in Idaho and soon in Washington about uh, uh, quarantining uh, and having seed inspected before it's sold in either state and, and, and needing to be treated with, with the fungicide. Uh, and you probably want to stick to at least a three-year crop rotation. Uh, Rhizoctonia uh, causes damping off and some root rot and, and a symptom called wire stem. This is a different race of Rhizoctonia that's a problem in, in our grains, but the other crops will harbor it, and so crop rotation is not going to do us a lot of good. Um, 
And this is the wire stem symptom here on your left. There's some healthy plants. And then over here you can see how it girdles the stem and, and makes them look wiry. And then these plants are going to die. So what you might see in your field is a healthy plant and right next to it would be a dead plant. I've seen this more, I've only seen this in winter canola actually. Um, I don't know why that is. Must be an environmental situation. Uh, like I said, seems to be worse in, in, the, in the winter canola. I don't know if crop rotation is going to help us much with this, with this disease. We do have a little bit of it around the northwest. But the new seed treatments I mentioned have better activity on, on rhizoctonia, and so those are going to help. The disease that you'll most likely see is sclerotinia white mold or, or, or stem rot. It's a soil-borne fungus. goes to just about any broadleaf crop that you might grow. It needs prolonged moisture, prolonged wet conditions to infect the crop. And so it tends to be worse when you have wet springs or if you're in an irrigated system. So it's going to infect the crop from little uh, resting bodies called sclerotia in, in the field. And those, uh, under the right conditions, will eject spores that will land on the flower petals and infest the crop through the flower petals. And again, it needs those warm, wet conditions. This is what the sclerotia look like in, a, in some seed. Uh, and these are also the resting body that would be in the soil. Uh, this is what they look like when they germinate under those warm, wet conditions. And these little mushroom looking things are going to, or where the spores will eject from. Canola makes a lot of petals, and they'll fall down and cover the ground. Uh, but they also land in like these leaf axle areas, and if the spores land on these dead petals, they can germinate, and then once they germinate, they can infect the plant. And so you'll see stems like that on your left with some white mold growing on them, or later in the season you'll see a plant that looks like it's early maturing. It's basically, the stem's been girdled and it's died, and it's not going to produce any seed. Uh, these are the sclerotia resting bodies inside the stem. And then those are either going to end up in the seed or back in the soil to infect the next crop. So start with disease-free seed. Got kind of a theme going here. Uh, Four-year crop rotation from a broadleaf is, is best if you can manage that. There are some fungicides that will work. Uh, two that are labeled are Endura and Quadris. Um, you're going to apply these at early flowering. But only if you expect your infection rate to be over 20%. Um, and there's a scorecard that we'll talk more about in the disease session tomorrow that the Canadians developed. But it's based on the incidence in the previous crop and what you expect the weather to be like. And if you come up with a score that's greater than 40, that's an indication it's going to be economic to spray one of these fungicides. But it's a, crop, it's a disease you need to spray before it infects. So you need to get control while, while those spores are coming up and just germinating. So that's what I have. I just had a two minute warning, so I'm actually right on time, I think. Um, and I think we'll hold the questions. So after Bo, is that? Uh, no, you can, I think if there's a, we will have a, an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session as well. But if there's a burning question right now that you want to ask, uh, Jim, uh, go ahead and ask it. Well, I went through a lot of information really quick, and so if questions do come up, you can feel free to contact me or Jack Brown, and there's our email and our phone, phone, phone numbers. Uh, typically, email is a little better because it gives us time to reflect on your question and actually get the right answer for you. Uh, but, but either way will work. Question right here. Is there a code to vernalization from So the Keep question. The question. The question is if there's an equivalent to vernalization on the winter canola, and yes, there is. Most winter canolas do require a cold period to flower. Um, some winter canolas have less of a vernalization requirement, and that will sometimes come up, become a problem if you're planting winter canola early to take advantage of moisture in your fallow, that there's a few varieties that will actually flower in the fall, winter canola types, and then you lose your winter, hard, your winter hardiness. Uh, but definitely winter 
typically winter canola is going to need that cold period over winter to induce flowering. What about the other end of the spectrum? Does it have to be a certain size or rosette size going into the winter in order to? Uh, so the question is about the size of the canola going into the winter. Um, it doesn't need to be a specific size to vernalize, but for winter hardiness, uh, it is direct, winter hardiness is directly related to the size of the plant. And so at minimum, you want to have at least probably three true leaves, uh, and the crown maybe as big around as a pencil. That would be a minimum. Uh, and bigger, more like four or five to six leaves. Uh, and, and a crown maybe as big around as your thumb or a little better is going to give you better winter hardiness. So unlike wheat, that's pretty hardy at a small growth stage. Canola needs to have some size. And so that's why the planting date is you know, earlier, like August 30th. If you have longer falls, if you're like in the Tri-Cities area, you could go later. Good. I think we'll hold questions for now, but keep that question in mind. At the end of the session, we'll revisit the, the question period. So I, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to uh, thank you, Jim. And yeah, keep, I think there's a place right over there for you to hang out. <laughs> Wanted to introduce uh, uh, Bo Blatchley next, and um, Bo grew up on a, uh, a wheat and cattle operation near Pomeroy, and still admits that he recreationally farms in the area. Uh, since 2011, he's uh, worked for uh, Winfield uh, Solutions, and uh, uh, thank you, Bo, for being here and presenting. And just before Bo starts, I want to remind people that there's CCA credits that you can sign up for at the back of the room there, so sign-up sheets there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dave. Boy, I hate, I hate hiding behind one of these things when I'm coming around on this side with you guys. Um, I was going to touch on a few of the things that Jim hadn't covered in his presentation. I was going to talk about seed bed preparation, uh, talk about spacing when you're growing the canola, and uh, depth of seeding. And I thought it'd be kind of fun at a direct seed conference to put a nice looking picture of a, uh, of a cleanly worked up field with the dust blowing through the air. It's pretty good for a direct seed uh, conference, but this isn't typically what we'd be doing with this crowd. Seed bed preparation, conventional or no-till. The first picture there showed conventional. That's the easy way to do it, but we've all figured out that that's not exactly sustainable farming if we want to do this another 200 years. So most people have moved into a minimum tillage system or a no-till system. One thing that's very critical with canola is seed to soil contact. And I've got firsthand experience of that. I, I hobby farm on the side because I don't like to sleep and, uh, and I like to lose a little bit of money and have a tax write off, good shelter. Um, two years ago, I was on my low rainfall farm, 12 inch rainfalls uh, north of Pomeroy. And I'd gone out there fairly early with my no-till drill, 30, 10 great plains. And it was following spring or winter wheat stubble. And in the chaff rows, uh, some of my combines have chaff row spreaders, some of them don't. And where we had heavy chaff rows, the canola came up fine, but we had a real high, uh, a real cold frost incidence where we got about 12 degrees when the canola was two leaves. And one thing that we saw was the canola that was in the chaff rows where the seed was not directly touching soil, where it didn't have the good contact, we had a high level of mortality in there, which resulted in me seeding into that crop. Where the, uh, where the seed was in, um, where it was touching bare black soil, like if you've got a good wavy culture that's working in a normal situation without a tremendous amount of chaff load, it'd be fine. And we didn't have any troubles that way. Um, trash wipers, wavy cultures, things such as that, very critical to try and make it so that you're putting seed touching dirt. Um, variety selection, there's a lot to the variety selection. How many of you people are thinking uh, winter canola is something you'd be looking at? Quick show of hands. Okay, and then uh, does that mean the rest of you guys are spring canola guys or just kind of killing some time. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll address both of them here. Winter canola, there's winter canola and spring canola variety trials. Um, University of Idaho has the most comprehensive trials in the Pacific Northwest, and so I rely on the, especially the spring variety trials there very heavily from them. And Jim, you said you've got a poster. I've got two big old poster boards over at the crop, cropland booth for 2013 and 2014 that's your work that shows where everything balanced out. So sources for figuring out what will work in your area, you got the U of I trials and also uh, we have our cropland genetic seed guides 
and I have a few of them. They're books that are back there on our uh, on our table that you can take. But easier than that would be to go to croplandgenetics.com and just punch in there, and uh, you can pick the West Seed Guide. And it has comprehensive. It doesn't show the yield trials for the areas, but what it does show is it shows response to uh, population, um, winter hardiness, um, shows what type of fertility to work with. It's it, that's another wealth of information there. But when you're choosing a variety. Try and pick what is shown that it works in your area. On the spring canolas, if you're in a uh, if you're in a 10, 12, 13 inch rainfall zone that traditionally gets hot, if you're looking on my line of canola, our 930 uh, spring canola has a super high heat tolerance. And if you look in the cropland genetics guide, it's going to show you which ones tolerate the heat and which ones are for the wetter areas. A wetter area would be a 955. Um, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at winter canolas. I hit a slide here purposely, but if you're looking at winter canolas, figure out what your area is. Uh, I see we've got Howard Nelson in here. Do we have anybody else that touches that Douglas County, uh, Okanagan area in here? Okay. Now, Howard Nelson sells a lot of seed up there in that Okanagan area, and they need something up there that's going to be pretty winter tolerant. And so there are rating systems that, that show what kind of winter tolerance you're going to have. Some of the varieties, especially some of the hybridized varieties where they have a little bit higher yield capability, like say our the high class 154, it doesn't matter if it's ours or anybody else's, a hybrid is gonna grow a little bit quicker and typically give up a little bit of winter, um, winter hardiness. In our line, uh, the most winter hardy thing that we have that we've had out for the last several years is the 115, and that's been basically the standard up in that Okanagan area. But this year I'm excited to announce we're actually uh, releasing three different varieties that have a higher winter hardiness rating and they're going to be the uh, high class 225, the uh, 220, and then the, uh, the new Clearfield variety. So if you're in a super cold area, that should be probably one of your biggest criteria for deciding which variety to go with. If you're in an irrigated area, look at something that's hybridized. Um, look at something that's gonna grow a little bit faster and put on a little bit more tonnage, like a, like a 154 hybrid, or there's several others out there. Um, other things to consider, you know, Jim's work and WSU's work on the variety trials, and Howard Nelson has good work too. You look at these variety trials and they go by location. Pick which location has the closest environment to what your farm is that you're currently working with. And that's, that's basically the best I can do as far as helping a guy try and pick their variety. Row spacing. Spring canola, probably a 7 to 12 inch uh, row space is probably ideal. Um, you can move up to uh, 15 inches in the spring and probably not hurt yourself too bad. But you get beyond that and you're going to have some troubles. Winter canola. Typically, uh, anywhere under 20 inches is probably 15, 20 inches is going to be the best. Um, where that comes into play is if you've got, uh, say, in my situation with super high winter wheat residue, if you've got a 30-10 no-till drill that's a 10-inch space and you're having troubles getting your seed rate down or you're having troubles getting through the trash, you can relax the springs on the openers and the, uh, every other opener will float over the top and then seed it on a 20-inch row. It's not a bad deal. I know we do have one grower in the area near Dusty, and he gets away with about a 34-inch space. A couple things to remember when you do try and get out to a, a wide, wide spacing like that is that's when you can start cutting back on some of your seed because if you've got all that seed stacked in on top of each other, you're, you're going to, uh, the, the stand is going to have a penalty. And I know that uh, in Dusty there, he's been successful with two and a half to three pounds. Qualifying all that, with as we move into uh, what kind of rates of seed, how many seeds is ideal for your farm? Well, if I'm in a 12 inch rainfall zone, I'm gonna put down spring canola, I'm probably gonna be shooting for about four pounds per acre. And that's assuming about 100,000 plants per, or 100,000 seeds per uh, pound. But if I'm in a higher producing area, I'm probably gonna ratchet that up closer to six. Um, another example to use that cropland genetics uh, guide that's on the internet, is we have a response to population score on not only our seeds, but many of our competitor seeds, showing which ones will actually increase uh, your yield capability by increasing your seed versus which ones will not increase your yield capability. Good examples of that is uh, that, that 930 that grows real well in the, in the super dry areas and has a high heat stress. 
that's one that four or five pounds all the way around the board, doesn't matter if you're in 12 inch rainfall or up on the Camas Prairie, four to five pounds is gonna be ideal. If you look at our uh, Braska Juncea, our Clearfield, our VTX 121, um, that's a different animal. The seeding rate on that, if you wanna maximize <coughs> your cropping production, you're gonna be about seven to nine pounds. So there is a lot of variation as far as how to, how to uh, decide what, side, what type of a seeding rate to work with. And so that, you know, if you've got a guide where you can look and see which varieties will respond, um, go with that. This picture that's on the board right here, this is uh, four pounds per acre. Looks like probably an okay stand in most cases, but if you got a little bit wetter area for seeding and you can get up to six, uh, 600,000 plants per, square, uh, per acre, you're probably gonna tie that into yield, unless it's one that really doesn't respond well to the, uh, to the increased seeding. Canola planting, seed smart. You gotta slow down, gotta measure your depth, Aim for a uniform stand and remember to, uh, remember to keep your seed tags. That's a critical one. I've been out to a couple different fields where guys have put in a, uh, a Clearfield variety. Roundup really kills it well. Next pitfall is on your Liberty links. Liberty is glufosinate. Roundup is glyphosate. They are not the same. Same thing. We had a, uh, our research trial in Pullman, Washington here uh, a couple years ago at our answer plot. And of all people to do it, our regional agronomist wasn't paying attention to which ones of the varieties were which type. And so he sprayed beyond over the top of some Liberty Link, annihilated it. The uh, test plot day was like four or five days later and so we were able to do a demonstration with that to show chemical injury, death. <laughs> so that worked. Um, when you're establishing your stand, in a spring canola situation especially, it's nice to try and target about 12 to 14 plants per square foot and if you're thinking through and you're, uh, you're running your no-till drill out there and you've got some spaces where you've got a good stand where you don't have a good stand, make yourself a hoop. Um, Nate's with our company in the back of the room. Is it 96 inches is uh, five square feet? Okay. You can take a chunk of NH3 hose if you want to get five square feet, cut it at 96 inches, splice it together with a, with a pencil and a chunk of duct tape, throw it out there. Five square feet's easier to, to nail down than when you're screwing around with one square foot because you'd be a little bit less or a little bit more objective. Count it out, divide it by five, figure out what you've got. Um, if, if the plants are robust, you know, five, five plants per square foot is plenty, but you are going to be sacrificing a little bit of yield. If you get under five, it's, it's a little bit thin. Another thing as far as the slowing down, this next, uh, this next slide, this shows the effect of uh, Cruising wrong with your tractor, say it's uh, conventionally worked or a minimum till work field, it's been worked more than once already, and you're seeding in a similar direction to where the last time was or the last pass that you went through. Look at where those little diamonds show. This guy's shooting for two inches on a seeding depth. If he's going four miles per hour, which is about the rate that you watch rain dry on a park bench, um, you're pretty uniform. If you crank that up to six miles per hour listening to the stereo, you're gonna see that your seed depth is all over the board. And seed depth isn't just critical in canola seeding, it's critical in wheat, it's critical in corn, it's critical in everything else. So just something to think about is you know, going back and seeing how your drill is performing. What kind of seed depth is ideal? Well, that's, uh, that's a pretty subjective question in itself. It's gonna come down to what time of year you're looking at. Um, in that spring canola that I seeded that uh, I had to seed into because of the death in the chaff rows, the first time it was in, I put her in about an inch. Felt pretty good about it. I was a little bit early on things. I was the first of April, um, 1900 foot elevation, uh, Pomeroy, Washington, uh, probably about the 20th of March. And then we had that frost the uh, end of April that nuked everything. Well, I sat there and contemplated, the more that soil warms up, I decided I would treat my uh, 955 spring canola that I put back into the ground on top of the, or I guess 930, on top of the 955, I decided to treat it like a winter canola. Well, we all know with a winter canola, you're gonna seed that stuff to moisture. On May 3rd, it was 80 degrees the day that I decided to go out and seed. And that was the third day in a row that had been 80 degrees. So where the soil temperature was warm, I stuck that stuff in the ground three inches and it flew out, it was up in four days. So your seeding depth, if you're looking at a winter canola, 
about the worst thing a guy can do is dust it in. Um, if you don't put that stuff into moisture, you know, if you're in an irrigated situation, it's different because, you know, Mr. Lyle, you're going to turn the sprinklers on, so it doesn't matter if you're in there a quarter of an inch or an inch and a quarter. Um, but most of us in the dry land situation, if you dust in your winter canola, chances are you're not going to get a big enough rain to come through there, germinate that canola, make your soil moisture meet in a timely enough manner to get that plant up to a dinner plate size before winter really hits. So winter canola, to me, it's, it's a crop of opportunity. If you've got the opportunity, if you've got the moisture out there to hit it, um, seed it in the ground, stick it in until the, the uh, planter is in moisture and you're assured that it's not going to uh, dry away in the next few days. So that's how you approach the depth. It can if the soil's warm, yes. You don't, stick, you don't stick canola seed in the ground three inches in March. You don't stick it in the ground in April. Three inches is what you do when, when the soil temperature is going to be around 80 degrees and it's going to fly. Same thing as when you're seeding in the, uh, in the summer. Um, there's a lot of debate as to when is the right time to seed my winter canola. And there are guys that push it clear back into June. I don't like it at all because you can end up with uh, good varieties that are in the ground that long. It's uh, fight or flight, and they're going to try and decide if they're going to bolt. Second problem with super early is you're going to run out of moisture. All the moisture that canola plant takes up and burns through its processes with through that summer season is not going to be available for your seed portion of the crop. Third portion is all the nutrients that you burn up. So how do you decide when to plant your winter canola? Best answer for that is plant that on the last day you think you can put that into moisture and get it up before it's going to dry down and die. So you pick that day. Um, how you can combat that because the guy doesn't want to quite be on that last day if you want to be a little bit earlier than that um, benchmark recommendation is going to be the last couple days of July through about the 25th of August uh, most areas we eat in the latter portion of August getting closer to September the soil moisture really moves down and you're out of luck one of the things you can do to combat it is uh, take your soil sample start out with that what kind of fertility do you have in the soil if you have 50 pounds of nitrogen available out there in the soil, my recommendation is if you're seeding on the earlier side of things, don't put down more nitrogen. If you're going to be pushing that envelope and you're going to be the 15th of August or 20th of August and you are going to be able to still put it in moisture, maybe put down some additional nitrogen. Because the more nitrogen that's available to that plant, the faster it's going to grow, the faster it's going to try and run itself out of water. Um, my personal farm experience, I'm not going to talk about fertility really because Jim kind of covered that. Um, get out of there. My personal farm experience is uh, I seeded my winter canola this year on July 29th or July 30th, right in that range. And I had darn good moisture because we'd had a, a, a thunderstorm come through. I had very little nitrogen that was left in the soil because it's kind of a mountainous soil in the farm that I was working with. It's uh, where I was seeding this is a little bit over 4,000 foot elevation. And so all I put down was five gallons of 1034-0. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to get that plant emerged and popped out of the ground as soon as possible. And then I just kind of wanted it to sit there and float until fall. Got into fall. Um, it was probably about the first of October, end of September. We got a little rain shower up there and, and I put my fertilizer on with stream jets. I went out with 85 pounds of N, five pounds of sulfur. Why didn't I put a lot of sulfur on yet? Well, it's gonna need that sulfur in the spring. So at my first opportunity in the spring, I'll probably go back out there and follow it up with a soil sample. And I'd, I would guess that overall sulfur, I'll probably be close to 30 pounds. And I'm gonna guess that my nitrogen is probably gonna be, be about 130 total for that area. And Jim pointed out about eight pounds of nitrogen needs to be available for 100 pounds of seed. Is that correct, Jim? Yeah. So you start kind of doing the math between what I'm applying, what's in the soil, that's what I'm looking for. This picture right here, this was taken on Sunday. The picture on the left is WSU's winter canola plots up there on my place. Looks pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> you, you go ahead and drill down to the photo that's a little bit closer and you can see in the center of that plant that those plants are still alive. The WSU plots flew out of the ground. Um, this is on fallow. And these plants were about this big around when we got into winter. And I can't, WSU, you guys in here, tell me what day that was on. I'd like to say that that was probably seeded about August 10th. August 17th. August 17th? Yeah. Okay, that was close. 
All right, so it flew out of the ground. Um, looks great. Looks great. Um, if you're going to start looking at canola, you got to look at what I call angry aesthetics if you're looking at winter canola. This is the rest of my field up there. This is where I put in the canola that was seeded like July 29th or July 30th. And you compare that with my winter wheat on the right. It's hard if you're just getting into this canola game to noodle it through as to how this is going to, uh, how is this ever going to compete at the bank? Because that winter wheat looks like a million bucks and the, uh, the canola looks like it was hit by a train. Um, this is a field entrance. The overall field looks more like this. This is the field entrance. It's got some compaction and this right here is a mystery zone where the previous owner uh, spilled something. Nothing's grown there in six years since I've had it. But uh, looking at the canola, you can't judge that. You can't judge that crop until springtime has come. I was invited to Elmira last year to look at some dead winter canola that was seeded extremely early and was two and a half, three feet across when it went into winter. It looked like Mexico out there. Everything was defoliated. And they wanted me to come the end of February. They wanted me to come take a look at it in March. I didn't go up there till the middle of April. And I'll be darned when I went up there in the middle of April, it looked like this canola that has a little plant coming out of the middle and it yielded well. So that's one of the things you gotta get by. Another thing that I'm gonna address is uh, harvest equipment. All right, what kind of specialty equipment do you need to harvest canola? That's one of the things that keeps growers out of it is they're worried about uh, not just the harvest, let's back clear up to your drills. Um, I challenge anybody in this room to sit down with myself or, or Mr. Davis and tell me what kind of combine you have, what kind of drills you have. I bet that between the two of us, we would have no trouble setting up to seed and harvest canola. All that equipment is gonna work one way or the other. I seed my canola with a 3010 Great Plains drill. I see it uh, seeded with uh, air drills. I see it seeded with uh, 455 John Deere drills, 750 John Deere drills, uh, all the way down the gamut. Harvest wise, um, if you look at this fancy looking combine, uh, this is a 1980 Gleaner MH2. I'm big into the direct harvesting. Um, there is a lot of pushing that goes on and there's a lot of swathing. Does anybody not know what pushing is? Anybody not heard of that? Okay, well just pushing is you take a, uh, you take a, looks like you put a backwards header on your tractor and you drive around the field and you knock the canola down and knock it down to where the, uh, the branches will lock in amongst themselves, making them pretty impenetrable to windstorms. And wind is one of the hazards of having canola. Um, most of the varieties, the modern varieties that are out there now, they, they're pretty tolerant to the, to the windstorm, but uh, the pushing will help hold that down. The second thing that pushing offers is pushing by kinking over those stems causes sudden death to the rest, rest of the plant tissue, so it will finish ripening. ripening. Reason I don't like pushing is sitting there at my table back there at the cropland booth, I'll show you three different uh, jars of canola. One of them is irrigated canola that weighs 44 pounds because it was pushed. And it was pushed and it kinks off that plant and then the plant just essentially dies so the seed doesn't go to full maturity. So I can take these old, old gleaner combines, get a bunch of kids out there, we can run around in the field, doesn't take much to set them, and we can harvest the crop. My dad's got a, uh, oh, a Case IH 2588 and if I can get him growing more canola then we won't have any trouble setting it either. So the equipment is not an issue. And most of these varieties are developed to be direct harvested. And so anybody that's, anybody that's, har anybody that's producing varieties that uh, when they try and run through their programs, if they're high in sh shatter, they get kicked out. That's one of the criterias. So quick presentation, brief presentation, but thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I, I think Howard's got a real good point there. Second thing, I don't know if I pointed out we're releasing four new varieties of winter canola this summer. Three out of the four are a higher winter tolerance than our 115, which is our standard up there in the Okanagan area. And the fourth one falls between 115 and our 125, and the 125 doesn't do that bad. So we're continuing to work that way. Um, in the background of the WSU picture there, you can't see anything of it, but in that wheat stubble that's behind there, I actually have recrop winter canola um, I think that winter canola is a crop of opportunity. I really don't recommend doing this, but we had a pretty big thunderstorm came through, actually two of them, and I had uh, moisture was down 18 inches from top to bottom, 18 inches, rolled into that wheat stubble, 
and planted the 115 and then a, another experimental hybrid variety that I knew would grow faster, put it in, and we'll see if I've got anything. So that's all I got. Which one of your spring varieties is the most heat tolerant? The 930. Okay, which one of the which one of the spring varieties of the cropland line is the most heat tolerant? The 930. How much more? What's the difference between 930 and 955? Um, I tell you what, when I reseeded that field where where I had to put the 930 into the 955, we had three days in a row that were over 110 degrees, and that's when it finally stopped blooming. And it was more of a function. The heat tolerance genetics in the last several years, probably in the last five years, has advanced huge. Um, it used to be if you saw 90 degrees for a day or two, your canola would start dropping its blooms and it wasn't going to recover. Where we're at in the genetics now, both the 955 and the 930, but especially the 930, if you have moisture out there, if you're over 100 degrees, it may slow down on the bloom, but it's going to continue blooming out until you run out of moisture. Mr. Lyle is asking where does the, where does the 930 uh, compare as far as Oriental mustard for its heat tolerance? And I'm not sure what the answer is there. I mean, Oriental mustard. Yeah. Is this mic? Is this mic is on. Uh, I'd say it's about the same. Okay. Roughly. Well, there's a fair amount of variation within Oriental mustard varieties as well, but. Um. Yeah. Two years ago, when uh, when I seeded that 930 into the 955, we had uh, we had a week's period there where three or four days were close to 100, and the 930 was a bit where it was seeded May 3rd or 4th, right in that range. It wasn't to the point where we wanted to stop blooming, and it, it slowed down on the blooming a little bit there into the 90s, and then it cooled off to about 75, 80 degrees the next week, and we saw more blooms show up. And then it was another week following that where we got over 110, and that pretty well nuked it. Wondering about the Anderson opener and where it drops in at an angle. Yeah. Now you say seed break, something to make it so it doesn't fall as fast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that would be beneficial because any time that uh, I showed that slide with the miles per hour as far as how the, the variance in the seeding is, any time you enter the field, you want to know exactly where you're placing that seed for when you set that drill. Otherwise, you end up with the wrecks of putting it in two and a half inches in, in March and killing a bunch of it versus the, the few seeds that are up at three quarters of an inch in March. So yes, I think that would be a benefit. The question is uh, when I, when I recrop the winter canola, which recropping winter canola is fine if you're in an irrigated situation. And so I was just taking advantage of it because I had the opportunity in a dry land situation, wondering if I had sprayed Roundup before or after. Um, I sprayed the Roundup after, the, after I seeded. I jumped right in behind, behind the combines with the drills, knowing that the rain that had occurred would get some stuff coming up, but I didn't want to wait for that. So I went out there with uh, 21 ounces of six pound Roundup as soon as I had a pretty good mat of volunteer and and there was some cheatgrass out there too that I killed. And I'll go back in in the spring and probably lace it up with another 21 ounces of Roundup. Yes, the, the question being what size of canola is resistant to Roundup, as soon as you see it, you can spray it. And the winter stuff is uh, 21 ounces of six pound Roundup once and then do it again in the spring if you'd like to. So that's what the tolerance is. When would I reseed the fall crop? Yeah, if it was a before, how far does that promote reseed? Um, if you go out there and you, you evaluate the, uh, the stand and you've got a hoop or you're just good enough with your eye that you're not seeing, you've got big blank areas out there. If you've got a, say if you've got a 100 acre field and you can section off a 20 acre piece that you can see the ground way too often to where if you try and do a, a count with a five foot hoop and you're not getting six to ten plants or you know say I guess if you're not getting a couple plants uh, a, a plant per square foot two plants per square foot in the winter stuff then you could look at reseeding into that and the reseeding um, you know Howard you can back me up on this I think but I think we've had a little bit of success up in your area with reseeding with the 930 the 930 spring canola um, into failed winter canola stands and the reason that that's a variety to work with is because it's fast growing and it will catch up quite nicely with the winter canola. 
Okay, another thing, you know, where Howard is using the 115 up there, the 115 was our earliest variety of winter canola anyways. So our earliest spring variety, trying to play catch up on it, you know, was a week and a half out. So that's not too bad. If you would have been looking at, uh, say, if you weren't in a super cold area and you had a, uh, if you had a 154 or something that was a later maturing variety, then it'd probably be right in there about the same time. But yeah, like you mentioned, that's one of the problems is if you have a, a, a poor stand of winter canola, if you do just let it go, you end up with a plant here with Jim, a plant over here by Chris, and one back there with Howard. Those plants are going to get about six feet wide, and uh, while the good portion of your field is ripe and ready to fall out of the pods, you're still going to have a bunch of green pods. So if you go in there when you've got a super thin stand, and you know, I, I'm available, um, depending on where you're at, I'm available. There are several other people that are available that will come and take a look at that field with you and help you decide when it is time to seed into it, if, it, if it's worth doing or not. Uh, the other thing to consider too, I think there's some crop insurance guidelines. So if you have crop insurance, they may tell you that you can reseed or not. I know they're trying to get kind of a, a, a good set of guidelines so they can be consistent on those crop insurance uh, valuations. Uh, when I've seen reseeding with winter canola, it's been on, like on a patchy situation. Uh, where there's spots of the field that were very thin or completely dead and so you basically had this pattern of spots of the field were 100% winter canola and spots of the field were 100% spring canola in which case you know you don't have any issues at harvest uh, when you start getting them mixed sometimes you have a little issue with harvest with some stuff that's still green and some stuff that's ripe and uh, the question is if it's more salt sensitive than wheat and whether or not you can put down all of your fertilizer with a double shoot op uh, op opener. You don't want to put very much fertilizer with the seed, but uh, if you have a couple inches of separation, um, I think you're, you're pretty good to go with, with all of your, fer all your fertilizer. Uh, at least in our plots, we have a, a flexicoil uh, shank style op uh, opener and we typically put down 180 to 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, as a dry formulation and we've not had a problem there. Um, I think you need to be a little more careful with anhydrous. Your experience with that Bo? Yeah it's you can you can get all the fertility if you're if you're seeding late enough in a winter canola situation or just in your spring canola situation where you want to put all your fertility down at once, as long as you've got the separation, I don't see a problem. Um, but when you're, uh, you're setting up starters or real close bands with the seed, then yes, that, that is a problem. You've got to really back off. It is going to be a little bit more sensitive than wheat. Um, drove all the way up to, uh, oh shoot, west of uh, Cooley City this winter and or late fall and took a look at one of those where we had the sulfur was was nuking the seed so yeah that that's a concern um, one other thing I just wanted to throw down real quick before we leave is on the uh, on the chemicals on the spring on your canolas our uh, Clearfield canola the cropland one is a brassica juncea and as far as putting clopyrolid or stinger down on a juncea variety I'm gonna ask that you don't do it there are other Juncea varieties out there. And what the problem is, is where, uh, where Stinger or Clopyrolid is safe on most all the canolas, if you put it on a Juncea, it's gonna turn it into a piece of rubber. And where we run into this problem typically is, uh, say up in the Camas Prairie area, where guys are going after a bunch of dog fennel. And you put it on, it turns to rubber, and that plant, because these areas usually have a lot of moisture, will continue to flower on the bottom end of the, the plant. Well, when the top of the plant becomes ripe and uh, if you don't run out of water the plant really never dies so that's a problem you could uh, you could spot treat a little bit of canna thistle out in a juncea and probably get by with it but you're gonna have to slow down the combine or you'll plug up um, so that was one point that I wanted to throw down second thing if anybody decides they're gonna save the world with tillage radish or with a uh, with a cover crop mix if the cover crop mix has anything that's related to a mustard or a canola, anything that's in that family, please insist on the person that's selling you that seed 
insists that it's got a seed treat on it, a fungicide that will take out the black leg because you don't want to be the guy that brings that to your neighborhood. And I had several calls up on the Camas Prairie last year when I was going up and visiting with people and they were talking about putting down these cover crops and it was all naked seed. And they were throwing, there was canola that was thrown in it, bin run canola, there were radish seeds that were bin run, things like that. And the, uh, the black leg is a big deal. Um, if the seed treat is on the seed, it's gonna take care of it at that level and you're not gonna start infecting fields. But you get that in your field, you've got that in your field. Then you move that tillage equipment from your field in a custom operation over your neighbor's field, he's got it. And that disease will get meaner as time goes on. Yeah, that's a, a very important uh, con, uh, important consideration. They just had a huge outbreak of black leg in the Willamette, Willamette Valley, and it's been traced back to uh, cover crop seed. So they, they raised a huge fuss about canola causing problems, but they brought it in with cover crop seed. Um, and with the uh, clopyrrolid on the brassic gensia canola, it causes pod abortion. And that's something I need to update my, my slide. So while the clopyrrolid stinger is labeled for traditional brassica rapa uh, or brassica napus canola, it's not, you can't use it on the brassica gensia. But those brassica gensia canola varieties are clear field types, so you've got another tool there. And I'll just put in a little plug for the next session in this room. We're going to talk about winter canola establishment and trying to improve winter survival. Uh, there's also going to be some fertility uh, in one of the later sessions too. So you can kind of continue some of these discussions.